Okay. Um, for those who don't know me, I'm Dan Wolf. Uh, this is my teammate, uh, Mary Kuzel. My daughter, Karen, Mary Kuzel, also. What a coincidence. Uh, we're tracking out there buddies' team. Today we're out there buddies. Monday we were Tuesday we're tracking buddies. Uh, I'm not going to go through all this in the interest of time. Um, this is the third year in a row we've talked about altimeters in front of this group. Uh, so I just kind of want to pick up where I left off, but you can look at that while I'm talking. Uh, last year we did a, a fairly intensive study of the four sources of NAR approved altimeters. I was told last year I said NAR certified and it made Ed LaCroix cringe every time I said it. So four NAR approved suppliers, which is a drill, Altus Metrum, Dialogic, and Perfect Light. And we did uh, 48 vacuum chamber tests with 10 altimeters. We had about 1,000 points of data. We found some issues with the micro peak filter. That's why Chad's data was wacky in his report, and a drill accuracy. Um, otherwise, we had really excellent correlation between all these little things we were flying today. They're pretty darn good for, for uh, what we paid for them. Uh, and we also started the certification test procedure for the drill alt BMP for the FAI. Okay. So this year is just kind of a continuation of some of that work. We wanted to complete the test procedure. First we had to figure out what the heck was going on with the accuracy of the Adrel alt BMP. Uh, then uh, perform the certification testing for the FAI. And then I thought, oh, I got these cool little alt BMP altimeters. I should fly them in some rockets. There's a concept. Instead of a chamber. Uh, and then investigate some issues that came out of this testing. <clears throat> so the first thing was uh, the Alt BMP. Um, thanks to Matt Steele, Steve Cristal, uh, they helped me get in contact with uh, Adrell, and this is the same Lezik from Adrell. Uh, he only speaks Polish, his son speaks English, English, fortunately. And we were able to confirm they were using a different equation. They weren't using the ISA. ISA is International Standard Atmosphere. <clears throat> they weren't using that equation, which is the equation the edict says to use. But then he said something in an email that I go, oh, shoot. He said, you aren't using their method either. You're using your own method. Uh -huh. And it turned out, I'll go into that. So, <clears throat> so he sent me some new software that contained the method we had been using and the method that was in the FAA edict. So we started testing with new software, found out that the accuracy issue was corrected, and we switched our software to use the FAI EDIG method, and we got a great correlation. It was just fantastic. And here's the data for it. And these percentages, <coughs> this is just the difference between the reference and the Adrells now, going all the way up to 4,136 meters. It just, it just blew me away. That, that made my day. I reported the trip, it made his day. Uh, so really good stuff. Mm -hmm. um, so then there's a bunch of stuff in the FAI edict that we have to test. About the only other new thing that I wanted to highlight was launch detect testing. Now I've talked before and I talked at Narcon, I want to make this pressure sensor emulator to do these kinds of things. Still not there yet. I said before, my favorite programming language is solder. So we're going to see, it takes me a little longer than everybody else. Uh, so it's not there. So I decided maybe I can do it with the chamber if I turn the power off quick, on off quick. And I was able to do it pretty good. So I, so I set a reference altimeter to detect at 15 meters. And the Adrell is set to detect at 30. You can see first 10 tests I did it didn't trigger. There was a few in here we thought it should have, 32 to 34 to 36. But then once I got up to 41, and above, it did trigger. <laughs> Given the way I was doing my testing, I thought that was pretty darn good and pretty close to 30 meters. So uh, overall, I was pretty happy that we were also to do some kind of testing for a launch detect. Uh, it obviously can be improved, but improved. But that was a, that was a new thing. So that's good. Okay, like I said, there was all these other requirements. The key takeaway here is that. Performance-wise, those are draw all BMPs really work well. Um, and I used to have the perfect flight as my gold, gold standard for altimeters, but I couldn't see where the alt BMPs were any worse uh, and, and really do well. 
there's a few functional requirements that were not met, and there's some funny things in the FEI edict, like it has to have this beep code for power up, and it has to have this beep code for this, and a drill just ignored all that stuff. They didn't, they didn't bother to comply to any of that stuff. Uh, so the plan is to have a waiver for those for the FAI, and then amend the, the edict to close on the functional requirements with non-compliance. But overall, uh, we were really happy with that testing. Uh, so then I had done a bunch of this testing, so I thought I should fund <coughs> some of these things. And we were going out to the NSL, and Ole James, who's the Southwest Region uh, Contest Chair, was going to have record trials there. And I thought, well, that's cool. I can, I can use these little tiny all BMPs to set all these low impulse altitude records. So I took my all BMPs out, took this computer out, and I did three flights. I did a flight with Marilyn Lang, who was a good friend of mine. I miss him. wish he was here at Merrim. Uh, but he had this cool model of the month from 63, I think it was. That's this low lifter one. I built one of those commemoration of Merrill. Took it out there to fly, so I thought it was fitting to put the drill in there for the first flight. Then I made a flight, a record attempt at half a altitude, set a new record. I think I more than doubled the old record because somebody was trying to do it with a with a, a larger altimeter. And then I flew a quarter a altitude to set a record because there wasn't one, probably because nobody could get the darn things to do a launch detect with, with the other altimeter. So all flights were su successful. It worked great. Uh, Oli James has got the records. Someday he'll send them in to Dan. He hasn't yet. Uh, so I got home from New Mexico. Had a great time. Um, transferred the data to my home computer. I turned on my home computer and I'm up looking at these files again more carefully. I said, geez, I don't remember that half a altitude being 133. I thought it was 137. And that's when I found out that's when I first learned that there's a difference between the way I was calculating altitude, what I call a single equation method, and the FAI, alti uh, uh, FAI method. And when I did all my vacuum chamber testing, the difference was so minor I thought it was insignificant. But these flights in Alamogordo, I'm getting about a 3% difference. So I wasn't too happy about that. So what's going on here? Um, so <clears throat> just a little refresher for our previous reports, we're both using this equation. Both the single equation and FAI use this equation. The difference is, I do it all in one swell of food. I, I put P0 in as my launch altitude pressure, P is my amplitude pressure, out pops my altitude. The FAI method says, put P0 as 101325 pascals, which is the F, which is the ISA altitude, our pressure at sea level, and then use P for the launch site pressure. Repeat, but this time make P the aperture pressure. You get two Z values, one the altitude of the launch site, one the altitude at aperture. Take the difference, and that's the altitude. Okay. So, um, my altitude for my vacuum chair didn't differently, definitely, but these did. Why? Well, what's the difference? Alamogordo has an elevation of 1,322 meters. All my flight testing was done in West Dallas, Wisconsin, elevation of 227 meters. So the higher elevation loss site was the reason. So I did some hypothesis testing, came up with a new test procedure where I go to the next, next slide, where I could draw a vacuum, get the altimeter at an altitude of 1,000 meters or so, and then arm the altimeters which was a tricky thing in a vacuum chamber, but figured out a way to do a details in the report. And you can see the difference right here. So I did a flight to a fairly high altitude, 1,200 meters. You can see my method is reporting higher. So the theory was confirmed. The question was, keep going, which method was more correct? I thought that my single equation was because I didn't think you could assume that the pressure at sea level on the day you flew was this. So I thought, my method doesn't care what the sea level pressure is, so it's going to be more accurate. How do I find out? Well, let's look at what method other altimeter manufacturers use and ask some subject matter experts. Well, I asked a couple, of, a person from uh, University of Wisconsin, Milwaukee. Uh, he thought my method was better. The guy from University of Marquette 
didn't know. Uh, so I went, went off with number one. So I did a bunch of more uh, vacuum chamber testing. What I found was every altimeter manufacturer is using the FAI method. Yeah. I, I was the outlier. Uh, I asked him these email changes with John Beans, very helpful from Jolly Logic. Really helped steer me in the right direction. So go to the next page. Time is up. Time is up. Mm -hmm. All right. What did you conclude from all this? <laughs> <laughs> so, great question. Go, go, go down a page or two. Keep going. Okay. Uh, well, I concluded that uh, we now have uh, our first FAI altitude cer certification, that the FAI method is the best overall, the deviation from ISA conditions does not have a major impact on accuracy. So this was the slides I didn't get to. Basically, you can vary the sea level pressure and I, what I did was I took the sea level pressure, the highest pressure reading for the last year in Milwaukee, and the lowest pressure reading for the year in Milwaukee, and I used both of those as P0. Well, I changed the altitude calculation by 0.6%. So it, I thought this was a big deal, and why my method was better. Turns out it doesn't have a major impact. So, so the bottom line is we have four altimeter suppliers. They all work really well now. They can be used interchangeably in our contest. We don't have to worry about micro peaks report higher, drills report higher, uh, jolly logic reports higher. They all report pretty darn much the same all the time. And it's because we're all doing it the same way, and we were able to prove that. Thanks for that question. <laughs> <laughs> There's another line here about temperature, and that's what I had a question about. Okay. So there's still a question, there's still some question on what we needed to correct for temperatures. Yeah, the reason my method doesn't work and one of the stuff we glossed over was that that equation that has that 44,000 number in the minute, baked into that 44,000 number, it assumes a T0 of 15C. Well, at my launch site on that given day, my pressure altitude is the pressure out of pressure f at that temperature. And so I'm trying, my, I, my T0 has to correspond to my P0. I can, I can pick an arbitrary P0, but I have to use the appropriate T0. So what I would need to know, I know you know the elevation of my launch site, and then use the lapse rate to say, okay, temperature's gonna drop from the 15C, because we're assuming 15C for everything. And then if I did that, my equation would work. But what we're doing is we're saying all the altimeter suppliers use 15C. So let's keep everything at 15C and then apply this temperature compensation equation at the end to correct for the temperature that you're actually flying at. And that's the math, that came out of Larry Curcio's really good report from 2008. And that's what uh, Chris Kidwell has baked into the software for the RCS for next year. We'll all be using that so that we're all playing on a level playing field. So you're saying that all the altimeters are uniformly giving the same temperature, but they're not for the same altitude, but they're not accounting for this temperature. That's thing. correct. And Chris is going to patch that. That's correct. And give us maybe the real altitude. That's right, a more accurate altitude. Because mm -hmm. if I'm up in Minnesota and I'm flying, or in Wisconsin, and I'm flying, let's say in March or April for my RCS flights, and it's 50, 60 Fahrenheit out. And Tom's down in New Mexico, and he's doing his flights the same weekend, and it's 90 degrees. There's a significant difference in, in, in performance there. So it's not fair to the people who live in the south, or, you, or if you fly on a hot, hotter day. I've been trying as a strategy the last few years to make my altitude flights in the morning when it's cooler, thinking I will get better results. Uh, I'll get a little boost. I haven't been able to prove it, but uh, based on the results I'm getting, but that's more my ability as a modeler. So this lapse rate, you also have to worry about the change in temperature as the model is flying, or is that such a short time that the model doesn't cool off enough as it goes up? That's the right. So, so the sensors have their own temperature sensor built into the die because they have to know the exact temperature of the die, the silicon die, to calculate the pressure accurately. And, it, and, and so it doesn't care too much about what else is going on. Because that die temperature isn't going to change like that. It's going to. It's got enough mass. It's 
so are we, are we going to be measuring temperature of the narrow field when we do these flights? Is that part of the yeah, whatever. What? Yeah, you have to record the temperature <coughs> on the new whatever your launch site temperature is, preferably before the flight. Um, you know, and you know, if you're within one or two degrees, you're going to be a lot more accurate than we would be if we didn't do it at all. So okay. I'm looking at the bottom. Uh, I'm good. Time's up. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you.